This is a production of Cornell University. All right, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'm really excited to be here finally after five semesters with all of my research that I'm gonna to present to you today. Um, and what we're gonna talk about is primarily LEDs as Neil mentioned, and specifically with their applications with lettuce and tomatoes. And then I went a little bit further and started to develop a curriculum supplement for middle schoolers for how can we get the next generation interested in plant science and how can we use current research to really build on that um, interest. So let's start out with just a little definition. What are LEDs? Well, LEDs are light emitting diodes. I know most of you are probably familiar with them. Um, and even if you're not aware that you're familiar with them, they're really becoming more and more popular in everyday life. Um, here is just you know, the basic idea of an LED. You, know, you can have a, a blue LED, a red LED, a green LED, any color that you want. They're really a lot smaller than traditional light bulbs. And they can be found in a lot of applications, such as these hobbyist computer decorative applications, um, also everyday applications with, um, now we're replacing fluorescent and um, other forms of light bulbs with these LED light bulbs, they're more energy efficient, as well as for us, what we're particularly interested in are the horticultural applications of LED lights. Since they do have a lot of flexibility in spectrum and color, that opens up a lot of opportunities for photobiological research. and we do tend to uh, pursue that research in greenhouses, in growth chambers, and with a lot of food crops. But what we focused on was lettuce and tomatoes. But why lettuce and tomatoes? There's a lot of reasons, one of which could be, you know, O'Neill told me I need to focus on lettuce and tomatoes. But really, uh, lettuce and tomatoes are some of the most popular food crops in the United States. So they make a really big impact on the agricultural market. So of course, they're a crop that we want to focus on. So first, let's talk about lettuce. My lettuce project looks specifically at quality, yield, and biomass efficacy of several different hydroponic uh, varieties in uh, cultivars in response to high pressure sodium and LED lighting in the greenhouse. Uh, and this lighting was all supplemental in nature. No, excuse me, no sole source lighting at this point. So the context behind this was we were working with a company CEA Fresh Farms. And this company wanted to develop a hydroponic lettuce production system, but they didn't know what cultivars they wanted to go forward with. And they didn't know if they wanted to use high pressure sodium lights, which were kind of an industry standard, or if they wanted to go with LEDs, which were a pretty up and coming technology. And they'd been hearing a lot about them, but they didn't know a whole lot about applications. Beyond that, we also had a lighting sponsor for this project, Lumigro. They helped us out a lot by actually providing us the LED systems that we ended up using for our lighting treatments. So this experiment consisted of three, well this, this portion consisted of three experiments. Experiment one was an initial investigative variety trial. It took place between February and December of 2017 and we had, uh, we looked at NFT hydroponics, this is nutrient film technique hydroponics. And what that means is that we had these, these channels where just a thin film of water flowed over the bottom of the channel continuously at all times. We had a one large nutrient reservoir where we adjusted uh, pH and EC uh, daily or weekly depending on the uh, conditions within the reservoir. And the objectives for this were we were looking at 25 varieties of lettuce just under high pressure sodium lights to get an idea of their performance in terms of tip burn, bolting, uh, how big in general did these varieties get, what was the color quality, and just overall what were their performances. So the outcome of experiment one, one was this table, which is, you know, it's a lot of information, really big table. And we came up with their uh, pretty general qualitative responses. There were no quantitative responses at this point. It was all just observations of, say, was tip burn observed or not? Was bolting observed or not? What was the general size? Was the general color? And what was the general type of 
lettuce that we were growing. But for experiment two, these are the lettuce varieties that we ended up going with. So after we had all of these observations made, the company decided that these were the varieties that they were most interested in based on um, we wanted a good separation of or a good selection of red and green lettuces. We wanted some head lettuce. We wanted some leaf lettuce. We wanted some romaines. So we wanted a good variety in that selection. For experiment two, this ran from January to May of 2018, so this year. And this consisted of three harvest cycles with what we now did was we split the table. Previously, there were 20 channels all under the high pressure sodium, but at this point, we split it into two 10-channel 10, 10 NFTs. They still shared the same nutrient reservoir, so the root system was still exposed to the same conditions. And what we wanted to do now is after we chose those 13 varieties, we wanted to compare how high pressure sodium and LED affected these two different, or these 13 different varieties. Uh, for this one, we knew we weren't going to get really strong uh, statistical data because our sample size per variety was going to be pretty small. So what we were doing was we were looking for what qualities that we wanted to further uh, investigate further on in the experiment. So for cycle one, for all cycles, we collected data on yield as well as electrical efficacy. For cycle one, we collected data on bricks. For cycle two, we had some taste test data. And for cycle three, we collected height and diameter data. Our environmental set points were um, maintained throughout the three harvest cycles of pH of 5.5 to 6.5, EC of 1.8 to 2.2, and our air temperatures were 21 during the day and 17 Celsius during the night. So what, what did our treatments look like? Well, as I mentioned, we had high pressure sodium versus LED. So what does that really mean? This is a spectrograph output of um, what our treatments look like in general. Our high pressure sodium spectrum tends to be heavier in the yellow and red zone with very little blue. You can see that the gray here is the high pressure sodium spectrum. Whereas our LEDs had blue around 440 nanometer and red at around 660 nanometer. And our treatment was a 20% blue, 80% red treatment for the LEDs. And each array provided a supplemental light level of about 180 micromoles. For lighting control, we employed an additional strategy of LASI. LASI is Lighting and Shade System Integration. And this is a computer algorithm that was developed here at Cornell. And what this allowed us to do was enter a target DLI, a uh, daily light integral, for both of our systems, where we could monitor the instantaneous levels of light with a quantum sensor at each table. And we could shoot for a 17 mole per day target, which is what's generally recommended for lettuce in the greenhouse. Both tables were controlled independently, so we had two of these sensors. So each of them had a different um, amount of light on per day, potentially. Um, or uh, different intensities at different times. And as you can see, as the cycles progressed through the months, less and less light was being provided to the plants. And this is because basically just due to seasonality, as we got further into the spring, more ambient light would um, be available to the plants. We tried to preserve the uh, treatment effect by uh, keeping the shade cloth closed uh, as much as possible but there's only so much we can do as I believe it was a 50% shade cloth. So that really ended up being, you know, at the, at the end of harvest cycle three, we were providing half as much light or needed to provide half as much light. So the st statistical analysis for this was performed uh, using R and we accounted for the effects of position in the table as well as harvest cycle one, two, or three. Um, we looked at lights and variety, as well as the interaction factor between lights and variety, which is very important. And uh, we used uh, ANOVA and predictive models and a Tukey's HSD, and you will see examples of all of these going forward. So just to start out with, um, for our experiment two results, we didn't really find any, or not many, statistically significant differences, which we determined as to be uh, at an alpha of 0.05. 
there were high variability within some varieties. And I've chosen to include this table of um, just raw weight data. So what this is, we have the varieties along the bottom and our weight in grams on the y-axis. And you can see these box plots represent uh, all of the um, raw uh, weight data that we collected. And you can see um, these within the quartiles, there's a large difference from the mean. There's a large range from some of the varieties where there's a shorter range from other varieties. And this is really important information for a grower to have, maybe not necessarily um, as, as important academically, but for growers, they want to know, are we going to be able to rely on this variety of lettuce to give us this weight of lettuce consistently? Or are we going to sometimes see lettuce of this size or that size? So having this, for, this information was important for them. But of course, we wanted to know statistically significant data. So uh, for us, with the Tukey's um, HSD test, we identified uh, approximately well, eight, eight groups. But there was a lot of overlap with pretty much all of our varieties. There was only one variety that had a statistically significant difference in means here where the LED was significantly smaller than the high pressure sodium. This is likely due to the fact that Theodore had a huge problem with bolting under the high pressure sodium lights. So consistently we would see at this point, at harvest point, we would see bolted lettuce under TDR with these really long stalks, really long flower stalks, and the high pressure sodium or the LED may have just begun to bolt. So that added to our problems here where we couldn't really say, you know, is this usable head weight. For um, bricks and glucose, we didn't really find any interesting trends. We looked at, for example, this graph is um, our bricks by um, just percent bricks, and then our glucose, which we measured using a one-touch uh, blood glucose meter, which may or may not have been the best tool for the job, but we were looking for a different data in some way to equate bricks percent um, total dissolved solids to a sweetness factor, which glucose may have been a way to do that. We didn't really find any relationship between bricks and glucose. We also looked at the relationship between bricks and variety. We looked at the relationship between glucose and variety. We also looked at lights and bricks and, you know, I, lights and glucose, and there wasn't really anything that we found that was interesting. So we decided to ditch this and move on. For um, cycle two, we looked at taste test uh, d data, where I went to uh, Dr. Matson's hydroponic lab and set up this taste test where we took one head from each variety and from each, each treatment. So we had 26 heads of lettuce. And they were not labeled high pressure sodium or LED, but they were labeled A or B, so it was a blind test. They were told the variety. And they were told to fill out a worksheet with three different categories, color, texture, and taste, and given an explanation of what each factor meant within each category. There weren't really very many statistically significant uh, results here. We used a chi-square analysis. There were only three that were interesting. Two of them were color, which we sort of expected to see. Rusai and Surat are both red leaf lettuces, and we both or we expected to see that um, under LEDs we would see more red than under high pressure sodium, simply due to the larger amount of blue light provided by our LED treatment. And again, with taste, only Tidor, Tidor, really showed a difference at all, being more bitter under the high pressure sodium than under the LED. And again, this wasn't really surprising because Tudor was bolting at the time. And as lettuce begin to bolt, they tend to get more bitter and taste really gross. That's why we don't want to eat bolting lettuce. And finally, for cycle three, we chose to look at height and diameter. And for diameter, we didn't really notice any significant differences. Some were close, but nothing below an alpha of 0.1. So we didn't mention them here. But there were some significant differences in height. So for this table, we've got variety, we have our high pressure sodium height, we have our LED height, and the p-value of the difference between the two. So typically, our high pressure sodium was taller than our LEDs by two to four centimeters, depending on 
the variety. But again, this is four out of 13 varieties that showed some sort of difference here. Still an interesting difference, and one of the reasons why we chose going forward to look into that more closely. And finally, for electrical efficacy, this might be a new term for some of you. What we chose to define as electrical efficacy was biomass efficacy or grams of edible mass produced per kilowatt hour used. And the way we got that was we summed all of our edible biomass produced, regardless of variety, per treatment. And then with our, um, our lighting algorithm, we were able to track how many hours on or our lights spent on and track how, much, uh, how many kilowatt hours they actually drew during that time. So we could come up with this number of grams of edible mass that we have divided by the kilowatt hour that that array, that treatment actually drew during the entire harvest period. And what we found wasn't too surprising, but it is still an important find, was that LEDs tended to produce two to three more times edible mass per kilowatt hour used. Now, if you're just looking at the edible mass produced, they look pretty similar, right? But the LEDs are using less electricity on a day-to-day -day basis, simply because they tend to draw less electricity than the high pressure sodiums. And based on this, we would make some recommendations of um, using LEDs during the summer uh, to save on electrical costs, or in the winter if heat production is not an issue. And I bring up heat production because high pressure sodiums tend to be very warm light. And during the winter, some greenhouse managers really appreciate that because having the lights on does help manage greenhouse temperature. Again, uh, another recommendation is that LEDs can potentially improve red pigment production, um, which based on our taste test and consumer responses, we can see some evidence of that, but it does require more of a, an in-depth look at pigment production and analysis. So for experiment three, um, this went from June to September of 2018, and this was also three harvest cycles. And what we did for this, was we went down to six varieties. So like I said before, in harvest cycle, or in experiment two, we knew we weren't going to get very strong statistical data because of our sample size. But at this point, we wanted to be able to increase our sample size by more than double and um, really pick which of the uh, morphological factors we wanted to look more deeply into. So here again, we still have the two uh, 10 channel treatments and some helpers are included here. And I had a lot of help harvesting. These were a lot of plants. And so with this cycle, these were summer months. So shade cloth was closed again. Um, and we were still sort of worried that our uh, lighting treatment would be a little bit diluted by the ambient light increase. The objective again, better, better statistical data. Um, and evaluating specifically yield and size. So the height and diameter is what we ended up uh, focusing on here. So for the experiment three results, again, we didn't really find any significant differences in yield. And what this is, this is our six varieties here, Crunchita, Green Star, Locarno, Rex, Herb Science, and Andra, two red varieties, two green varieties, one romaine and one large open leaf head. And you can still see there, Pretty, we, we've got a pretty good distribution of different sizes. Uh, some varieties were larger under high pressure sodium, some under LED, and some were pretty equal. So, you know, nothing really to be said at that point. However, when we start to look at height, we do see some differences here that these are statistically significant, um, less than an alpha of 0.05. So for a green star, our very large head, you can see um, there was a very large difference. And Xandra, one of our red varieties, also a very large separation between high pressure sodium and LED. The high pressure sodium tended to be taller, which with um, lettuce, how we measured that was chopping off the lettuce heads at the base of the channel and measuring just from the, from the bottom to the tallest point on the head. So not necessarily the inner stalk height. Um, so what we attributed this to was potentially the uh, factor of the increased blue light from the LEDs. Blue light tends to inhibit stem elongation, and this may have inhibited, um, this may have been the factor that was playing the largest role in our height difference for the lettuce. And with the diameter, we saw even more 
um, variety showed a significant difference. Um, again, it was uh, Crunchita, Green Star, Locarno, and Xandra. Only one of our red varieties, although the other one looks like, you know, there were still differences between these two. They just weren't statistically significant. And what we could attribute this to was potentially, so for this one, what we saw was a lot of times we had our high pressure sodium be the wider head of lettuce, not in all cases with Crunchita, but this tended to have a more compact and upright form already as a romaine head. Um, but red light, red light and far red light tend to promote greater leaf expansion, which may have been the cause of this one. The Green Star, Locarno, and Xandra all were very open heads of lettuce. So with those wider leaves, they may have, um, the far red and red in the high pressure sodium definitely may have encouraged greater leaf expansion there. So for our conclusions, yield really didn't show much of a difference between high pressure sodium and LED. So you can probably grow pretty comparable weights of lettuce heads, uh, whether you're growing under high pressure sodium or LED. Some morphological uh, features were affected, but the practical significance of this could be argued because the difference tended to be somewhere between one and four centimeters. These weren't drastically larger heads of lettuce, but statistically, it was significant. And by producing lettuce of comparable size, LEDs can save a significant amount of electricity, as we saw with the, um, the biomass efficacy numbers. And this may recommend it as a really good source of supplemental light for hydroponic lettuce in the greenhouse. Future work, um, this project leaves open some areas of investigation for anthocyanin production between red, um, red varieties of lettuce. We grew a very large number of red heads and they all showed a very different pigment production response. So that would be an interesting area of investigation. We could potentially go through different ratios of red and blue. We only investigated one, a 20% blue, 80% red. And we could also go through seasonal comparisons where we choose one experiment and grow it all year long instead of just doing the three uh, harvest cycles. So moving on to tomatoes, um, what we were concerned with in tomatoes is not necessarily a supplemental light source, but we used LEDs as a sole source light. And we grew microtoms looking at the response of tomato growth, yield, and ascorbic acid content in response to different red and blue light ratios. But why did we want to do this? Well, this project came out of a proposal that we designed um, for NASA. Um, initially in 2016, we applied to have the microtoms be used in the, uh, as, a sort, as a source of, as a fresh source of vitamin C, potentially as a crop to be grown on the International Space Station. There are several uh, plant production facilities that NASA is pursuing, one of which is the Advanced Plant Habitat, or the APH, pictured here. Um, this is, quote, large plant production, uh, but as you can see, it's still a very small, small uh, system, 43 centimeters by 43 centimeters. So large plant is very relative. Um, and the reason for this is they do conduct active plant science research up on the International Space Station. And pursuing fruiting and flowering crops as a source of fresh vitamin C is important for potential uh, long duration space missions or anywhere that um, you know, fresh, fresh produce may not be uh, available on a, or on a consistent basis or where supplements may have time to uh, degrade on the shelf or in storage. So what we looked at was um, we started growing microtoms, which is a, cult a dwarf to uh, determinant cultivar of tomatoes. This took place between December 2017 to October 2018. So this was um, almost a year. This was conducted in the growth chambers at Kenneth Post Labs, two chambers in fact, and each chamber had two lighting treatments and they were both set up pretty much like this. We had our table where this is the seedlings, the plant shown at the seedling stage, and we had our lighting treatments. So 
two bars represents one light delivering one treatment. And behind this is a, another similarly set up light system with a physical divide in between the two. And performing some light spillage uh, measurements, we found that the overlap really was only one to five micromoles. So it was really a very small amount of um, light spillage between the two with this physical barrier there. So we performed three replicates of this um, experiment. They were seeded into these flats. They were transplanted into four inch pots and then six inch pots. And again, the lighting treatments. I will go into further detail with that in a second. But what we collected was data on seedling height, fruit yield statistics, uh, bricks, ascorbic acid, and fruit and flower count. Our set points were um, air temperature of 22 to 24 degrees C, and our relative humidity was 30 to 35%. So what were our treatments? Each of those lights delivered a different uh, lighting treatment to our plants. And there were four total. And what we were looking at was how do varying levels of blue light affect these different factors that I just mentioned. So we had a 55% red, 45% blue treatment, 70% red, 30% blue, and 90% red, 10% blue. With our blue light being at about 440 and our red light being at about 630. For our control, we had a 45% white, 55% red treatment where our white was this broad spectrum, 4100 Kelvin um, color temperature. And again, our red filling up the rest, where each of the lighting treatments supplied 300 micromoles of light uh, for 14 hours a day. For the statistical analysis, we took into effect or took into account the uh, effect of uh, chamber, was it in 16 or 18, uh, which harvest cycle, uh, one, two, or three, that would be um, one of the replicates, uh, harvest number. Uh, seedling group and treatment one to four. Again, we used ANOVA and a two piece HSD. For results, with fruit size or fruit yield, bricks, number of fruit, and fruit size, we didn't see any statistically significant differences at all. Um, and this is most of the um, harvest statistics that I mentioned previously. However, we did see a couple of statistically significant differences um, in seedling height. Uh, here we have our height data over time. So uh, seedling height measurements were conducted over a period of three weeks within each of the three replicates. And on day one after transplant into the chambers, at day eight, so the next week, and day 15, a week after that, uh, seedlings were measured, and we found that the control treatment and the medium blue treatments were tallest over time, with high blue being the shortest. And this is generally what we would have expected for this, but not quite as strong. Uh, and the reason for this may have been because we did not germinate the seedlings under the treatments. We germinated our seedlings and grew them to about the um, first uh, true leaf stage and then we transplanted them into their treatment cycle or treatment area. So we may have been diluting the effect of the lighting treatments at that stage uh, by waiting that long to apply the treatments. For fruit and flower count, um, we did find that low blue and control had the highest number of flowers for the longest time. So we could say that blue light has an effect on flowering time in that low blue or having less blue seems to lead to more flowers. Whereas with medium blue and high blue, we saw the highest number of developing fruit over time. And this could lead us to think that, you know, maybe there's something to do with um, flower initiation uh, and maybe fruit set. But to really understand this, we have to understand what the connection is between blue light and flowering. So in Arabidopsis and long day plants, flowering is promoted by more blue light, but tomato is a day neutral plant. And what has been seen in the research with that is that flowers tend to occur sooner with lower blue light levels. So we could say that blue light is repressing flowering if you're applying higher and higher amounts of it. 
and typically the uh, cryptochrome 2 reactor is primarily involved in this flowering response with blue light. So going back to look at this again, what we could say is there's probably an influence of um, blue light on flowering in that we saw more flowers with the, um, the lower amounts of blue light, but fruit set is probably a different mechanism that may need to be investigated separately as the, um, the results don't seem to really jive with the low blue light being the uh, suppressor or high blue light being the suppressor of flowering. For ascorbic acid, um, initially we found some interesting results from our replicate two um, relative ascorbic acid content. We thought, you know, this looks like there might be some differences within the treatments, but we can't really determine what exactly is happening here. This is our low blue, our medium blue, and our high blue treatment and our control. There's almost a trend, but this medium blue really kind of you know, bucks that trend. Um, so with replicate three, we ended up going through and doing several more total ascorbic acid concentration analyses and really didn't find anything. What we could attribute this to is the fact that ascorbic acid really is produced in response to stressors, environmental stressors, and my plants really did undergo a lot of environmental stress, unfortunately. We had a powdery mildew outbreak in our replicate two, and in our replicate three, we had a pretty severe th uh, thrips infestation, leading to a lot of plant damage and stress. So that may have masked or influenced some of our responses in terms of ascorbic acid analyses. So for our conclusions for that one, ascorbic acid production is uh, affected by environmental stressors which may override the blue light response. Um, increasing levels of blue light can positively influence the number of fruit produced but decreased time spent productive in microtom and consistent but short-lived fruit production may make microtom unsuitable for applications in long-term space missions. So for future work for this one, we probably want to look into how to better control pest, nutritional, and environmental pressures within the growth chambers. You would think that being in the growth chamber already would help us to control all of those environmental stressors, but unfortunately we probably didn't observe strong enough um, isolation protocols. Um, a larger sample size on the ascorbic acid analysis would be great. Um, our sample size for all of the ascorbic acid analyses tended to be six plants per treatment with a total sample size of 24. So that's it's a very small end for this and it really could have also prevented us from finding any significant findings. We might want to investigate different varieties of dwarf tomatoes. I thought this one was probably um, our, our best bet to actually finding some positive results. We didn't really do any um, investigations of any other dwarf varieties, but we had had some suggestions over time of you know, possible varieties to look into, so that would be a good one. And investigation into the effects of blue light on fruit set. I don't really know very much about fruit set, and it wasn't really the focus of my research, but we did have that one finding that may have indicated there was something going on. So more research either on my end to see if there is good literature out there on that would be a good idea, or maybe a whole nother um, project where they focus specifically on the fruit set effects. So finally, my education chapter. Um, this, is, uh, what, this is what we wanted to, or this is what I decided was going to be very important for me. How do I get my research, how do I take my research and make it more accessible to the next generation of scientists and agriculturalists? And why is this important? Well, plant science is, plant science and agriculture related degrees make up less than 10% of the degrees conferred in the US over time. There's a lot of stuff on this graph, but what we wanna pay attention to is biological and biomedical sciences. Bottom here is the year. You can see this line, this is the number of degrees conferred uh, compared to all of these different degree fields. And biological and biomedical sciences is already near the bottom of this graph, but that still takes into account biomedical sciences, of course, but also things that aren't necessarily related to plant science, like vet sciences would be in here as well, and other biological fields. So my objective with this chapter 
was to answer the question, how do we get the next generation interested in plant science study, or even just science in general? Because looking back at this, we see engineering near the bottom as well. And this doesn't even really account for some of the other sciences. Uh, we want to start focus earlier with more interesting applications. Really, what, what's going to be an interesting application for the next generation? And how do we make more advanced biological concepts, biological science concepts, except accessible to middle schoolers in particular? So in order to start doing this, I looked back at my research and I thought, what do they need to know in order to understand this? Well, they need to know about photosynthesis and photobiology, and, and middle schoolers do tend to learn about this, but it certainly isn't a focus. They need to learn about light and light spectrums, understanding what does a graph like this mean and how does it affect um, its environment? How does it comment on its environment? Interaction with, of light with different materials, say for example, how does light interact with greenhouse materials? Uh, technology as well, hydroponics, lighting, control systems, all of those were used in my projects as well as environmental effects. We look at things like air temperature, relative humidity. We look at intensity and quality of light. We look at all of these things, CO2 as well. So they need to have an understanding of all of these things in order to really even begin to understand the type of research that was presented today. So what I came up with to sort of guide the discovery of all these topics was a, a concept, shoebox photosynthesis. And we, I decided to focus on specifically a core activity or an experiment that can be performed as a class. And the, the central exper experiment uses LEDs in a small classroom environment. And I came up with this little, this is an illustration. Um, unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to actually employ this supplement of activities. So we're just gonna tell you about it today. Um, so, we are using LEDs in a shoebox to grow lettuce and really show how different LED colors can affect lettuce. And in order to do that, we chose red leaf lettuce, of course, because the pigment production response of red leaf lettuce is very well documented and does happen very quickly. Um, and as they go through this journey, they learn about plant science, the nature of light, biology, environmental awareness, and critical thinking, at least. Those are the goals. So the framework of these lesson plans, they're given an initial scenario. Why is red lettuce red when grown outdoors, but green when grown indoors? Students then will grow their own lettuce seedlings over the course of four weeks alongside the teacher lettuce project, which is the shoebox photosynthesis I mentioned. They collect data on the lettuce, they formulate hypotheses, they learn about how to conduct research and they compare lettuce performance with a total of 14 lessons. Uh, some of these are how does photosynthesis work, building a spectroscope and understanding light, um, understanding environmental requirements for plant needs, and analyzing class and individual data on lettuce seedling performance. So a really important context to add to this is, um, you know, you can't just design a classroom as curriculum supplements and just put it out there. There are standards and you have to meet these standards. So what are the current standards for middle school science education? Well, currently next generation science standards is really popular both uh, state and federal level. And what they say for sixth to eighth grad graders is um, they really need to focus on these core topic areas, structure and function of cells, signal processing, awareness of photosynthesis, and cause and effect relationship between the environment and organism growth responses. So our curricula, our proposed curriculum supplement does hit all of these points. Um, some of the example, excuse me, some of the example lessons, of course, what do plants need to grow, covers the structure and function of cells, uh, the nature of light, how do plants use light, shoebox light treatment, these are all involved in or these all cover topics that the next generation science standard deems as important. However, this is only a curriculum supplement. So there are standards that, there are subject areas that may not be covered by this curriculum. Again, with, um, as a supplement, and in middle school, I do remember doing a lot of these as well, 
And after speaking with teachers, this is still apparently um, the standard. People do a lot of career and personality testing in middle school and early high school. They start to learn about college. They start to learn about what are their interests in potentially furthering their education or where do they want to work. So this curriculum supplement gives them some um, examples of plant science related uh, areas that they could go into. We talk about things like plant hunters, which sounds really dramatic and of course is, is great to get the uh, middle schoolers attention, where these people go out into um, you know, potentially not uncharted, but not well known biological areas and look for new varieties of plants and categorize them in herbariums. There's also the um, space agriculture uh, idea where there's, um, there's examples like the lunar greenhouse, which I worked on in my undergrad, where uh, they're developing a greenhouse to grow plants on the moon or Mars. And then there's also um, plant propagation and genetic modification of crops, which of course is a hot button topic for a lot of people. So they may have heard of that before going into this at some point. It also plans in-person visits to real local research or production centers to give them an idea of what this actually looks like if they were to see um, something, someone doing something for plant science on a day-to-day -day basis. So conclusions and future work for this one. Um, meeting current science standards for teaching uh, while using plants and plant science can be done for middle schoolers. And the conclusions of this, or the results of this are to be determined. So future work would really be you know, testing it in the field, actually finding some teachers who wanted to do something like this and going through the curriculum and seeing how it actually worked. Uh, we would also wanna gather opinions from current teachers on the viability of this curriculum and interest in this type of curriculum supplements. We really wanna answer the question going forward of how do we balance the study of plants with the study of humans and other animals? Because plants are often left behind a little bit when you're studying biology in middle school or high school. And we wanna, we wanna fix that. So acknowledgements. Of course, I wanna thank my committee, Dr. Matson, Dr. Timmons, and Dr. Perry. Thank you very much. And Lou McGrow, CEA Fresh Farms, Francois for statistics help. I could not have done it without her. If you need statistics help, definitely go see her. And of course, the entire Matson lab, everybody listed here, was at some point or another enlisted for data collection activities, and I, I really appreciate that. And of course, all of the greenhouse staff who helped me care for my seedlings and my plants on a daily and weekly basis. All right, with that, I open the floor to questions. We'll take general questions now, and then more detailed committee questions afterwards. Any questions? Yes. I'm just curious, um, in the curriculum component, why did you choose to work with middle schoolers? Um, because I felt like, looking at my research, I wanted to introduce some more complex topics, and I felt like that was the point at which you start to be able to have them do some more interesting activities and give them a little bit of time to actually, like, do some more reading based research as well. There's a component where they do have to do some um, library and internet research as well, and they do a little bit of writing. So I felt like that was the level where they could start to handle that type of work. Yes. Do you look into like the cost at all, like with implementing those systems in schools, like the LED lights and pH hmm. meters and? So looking at the cost of implementing those systems, I, I did do a little bit of that. Mostly what I focused on was the physical cost. There wasn't any thought of pH meters, for example. The systems we were looking at were very, very rudimentary. It would just be um, buying little LED boards, very small ones. The hobbyist ones are actually available for reasonable prices, um, 10 to $20 each, sometimes less. And um, cost of materials such as seeds or you know the cups, the shoe boxes, stuff like that. It's it's not too much, but there was some done. So I didn't recommend that they buy things like pH meters because I knew that would be too much. Would they? I, and you haven't built this yet, but do you think the LED boards would give enough light to actually grow a plant? Um, I think they would, given 
the distance they are from the plant within the shoebox. Um, they're less than a foot, typically a distance from the um, bottom of the shoebox. And then you add the cup and the pellet that they're grown in, they're an inch or two higher. You can even increase or decrease the distance by boosting up the plant that you're growing with some, um, just something else to make it higher underneath. Uh, but for, in general, like to grow a really big head of lettuce, no, they're not gonna provide enough light. But seedling stage and baby leaf stage probably will be okay. Definitely not commercial quality, but enough to show growth and response to the light. Yeah, four weeks. Yeah, yeah, probably. And that's about enough to make a large seedling. So, okay. anyone else? No? Okay. Yes, you wowed us. So, um, so I answered all your questions. Point, thank you for coming, and we invite everyone but the committee to leave. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.